last uh, meeting after, was it four years, Justin? I served a partial term, so I think it's three. Um, I don't know, so something like that. Normally we yeah. do a pie in the face or something, but we couldn't do that for him this time. So we sent him a cake to his house. <laughs> cake in the face. <laughs> My daughter was very excited. <laughs> And then we've uh, accomplished our mission. <laughs> no, but seriously, Justin, thank you. Um, it's always uh, it's it's always a little harder than it might look, especially Justin's done a really great job to to be the chair. You, you kind of have to manage a lot of different unexpected things. Um, there's been, all, of course, a whole raft of those in this year of COVID. So just want to really appreciate all the years of showing up every month. And then this last year, especially of working through this kind of unusual context and you know, as I just as a city employee, I want to express our gratitude for your service. And I know that our community also really appreciates that you've taken that time to serve um, in that way. So thank you very much. Thanks. Appreciate it. It's been a, it's been a great opportunity and uh, yeah, I'm going to miss you guys. Yeah. It's been great to get to know you just look with you. Hopefully our paths will cross again in real life sometime on the bus, <laughs> on the bus. Exactly. Marty, at least Marty and, uh, well, those of us who live in Table Mesa, I get to run into them in the streets. Marty and Miriam. Um, well, great. Thanks, everyone. Um, but I still have one more meeting to run before <laughs> passing on to Marty. Um, so I guess the air quality piece is next. And so I, I don't, I think, I don't know if you want to start, Brett, with what you and Miriam and I believe Carolyn have been working on with the regional partners or if we should just jump into the um, ME and uh, the CU group? Well, I think it'd be actually good oh, to yeah. frame this up with the uh, with the piece of the follow up to the county air quality piece, because that's such a good context of what we're trying to think through, work through here. So just uh, later this, this afternoon, I sent out to everyone um, something that, that Miriam was generous enough to put together for us which was a kind of report out of the session and then some suggestions for um, to the city about sort of talking points or follow-up points that we might consider in terms of continuing to work with the county on some of these issues. But Miriam, do you, would you be willing to kind of walk through this a little bit and maybe just emphasize a few things you want to highlight? I'm sure. And just <laughs> uh, Colin, uh, I guess we'll, we'll talk about having a com conversation with you guys <laughs> after this. There, there is some, some discussion of, of meeting with the county after uh, on this topic. Um, so, so basically what, uh, it was a really great meeting with the regional partners and really interesting to hear about what the districts are doing with their monitoring plans and, and different types of monitoring exercises. Um, there was a surprising amount of variety it, 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 with what was being done. Um, as I've expressed before, I believe the work that uh, Fort Collins and Denver are doing stand out as examples of, of really exceptional things that can be done to, to in the monitoring world to protect the citizenry. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was also here interesting to hear what some of the smaller communities are dealing with um, as far as reaching constitu constituents and, and um, how they're getting the word out uh, to the people that they need to get the word to. Um, uh, you know, as we've had the presentation as well about what Boulder County is, is doing, um, in, uh, very interesting information about collection of ozone pollution and toxics, um, but limited information with regard to particulates for, for Boulder and Boulder County right now. Um, it uh, was also helpful to understand more about uh, what the state CDPHE is doing uh, as far as their network and what potential resources might be available to the greater community. They talked about um, loaner monitors that could be uh, given to the different areas, uh, particularly with respect to the fire management and smoke management around the wildfires. Um, messaging was a big topic in the meeting. Uh, there was a, a lot of discussion about um, 
how to reach the public most effectively. Um, Denver talked about a phone app that they're developing. Uh, Fort Collins uh, has the benefit of visibility monitoring and data that they use in, in their sort of messaging, which is really interesting. Um, th there was uh, a presentation about the uh, AQI, the air quality index um, that is used as sort of a, um, it, it's used to describe, you know, whether the air quality is good or not. And, but there's discussion about, you know, making sure that it's understandable and, and relatable for the people that are reading this message and, and that it's, it, that's, it, it's a good representation of what's being measured as well. Um, uh, talked about messaging, uh, targeting the messaging regarding uh, what kind of community uh, is being uh, addressed. Um, talked uh, a lot of discussion about whether um, public indifference was a problem or whether, you know, how are we meeting, reaching the people that we need to reach, that kind of discussion. Um, there was a general consensus <clears throat> that clear and consistent messaging across the state would be beneficial. And so the follow-on work from the workshop, at least from my understanding, is that <clears throat> there was a goal to have a shared data and creation of a technical group to uh, come up with a way to present data um, in, a, in a way that's good for the whole community, and then also shared messaging and, and targeting different art, um, audiences and different modes of communication. So that was mainly the, the report out from the workshop. I don't know if we want to talk about um, what I thought we might bring up with the county at this point. You know, actually looking at the agenda, I, I think it might make sense now. This is sort of like, we'll do the information gathering essentially or information presentation. So why don't we have the ME and V students uh, go through their pieces and then we can kind of wrap that up by thinking about next steps, if that makes sense. Can I just, can I just ask a follow-up question first? Um, who was at the meeting, Miriam? I, don't, I guess I didn't see it in the email. Oh, um, it was, representatives from almost every um, small city, county <laughs> in the state. Uh, there were, you know, representatives from all over. We had people from Aspen, from Eagle, from Fort Collins. Um, it was it was everywhere. Uh, and it was really interesting to see what the different the different areas were doing as far as managing the air quality for the, their citizens. A quick okay. question for me, if I could, just real quick. Was the Weather Service present? Uh, my understanding is that the Weather Service puts out an air quality statement of some sort. Can you? Uh, so it wasn't the Weather Service who was there with CDPHE, it was the state air quality um, de department, basically. And, and CDPHE also posts uh, uh, based on their monitoring data. Um, for the whole state, which is statewide. They have monitors all around the state. Um, they, they post uh, air quality information associated with that. I don't know if there's a link to the NOAA website specifically, but um, I would not be surprised if they worked with them in some way. I don't know. All right, very Neither. good. Yeah, okay. Miriam, if yep. this is Colin, um, uh, yeah, so I was the organizer of the- uh, And Colin the, was the organizer, yes, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I, um, um, I'm uh, just gonna ask anyone who would like to uh, be in the loop and receive more information um, to uh, drop something in the chat or drop me a line. Um, and, and they can certainly go through Miriam because we're in touch. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to supply more information. This is a, this is definitely a more the merrier network. So a um, great summary though, Miriam, thank you for doing that. Great, sure. thanks, thanks for the offer, Colin, and sounds like a great group you put together. It's nice to hear that all the, these 
local governments and regional groups are talking. Yeah, with that, uh, Justin, maybe we should just go in <clears throat> to the ME and V presentations. Great. So, Colin, are you the one coordinating that, or is there somebody oh, else I should no, be the, turning the, things the, over to? The I students are self organized. Okay. <laughs> I'm just in an advisory role. I will go ahead and share my screen. Great. Thank you, Caroline. Caroline. As you're doing that, this is Jonathan. I'm going to tee this up just very briefly at the at the risk of being too long-winded. I, I um, board members Jonathan Cohen, um, acting director of the Climate Initiatives Department, really appreciate you all taking the time to hear from these amazing students. Um, and I will also note that William Shutkin has just popped into the meeting, who um, is kind of the lead uh, and our, our key kind of conspirator in this issue. I, I, the, the reason that I wanted to tee this up is I think the conversations that you all have been having on this topic going back several months now, I think really prompted us as the city to really dig deep in terms of how we can build some stronger collaborations and relationships, not just uh, with like Colin, who is an absolute rock star and working with the AQCC and the Air Pollution Control Division, um, and really thinking about the regulatory approach, but how do we think kind of the research arm and, and our partners at CU, and then how do we as kind of public agencies start to think about the things that we can do at the local level? And it's been really stimulating, I think, to, to, to look at this from different angles. Um, it, and the only other piece I wanted to say, and then maybe ask if you want to um, add any brief remarks to uh, the, these students that you're um, going to hear from tonight are, are really incredible. I've had the, the honor to work with many of them um, over oh, close to about a year now, and I've just been really impressed with their level of insight and what they're bringing forward. And so I, I really when I heard that this was a topic of continuing conversation, I thought it was really important for the two pieces to link up a little bit in terms of the research that's going on and how that could be applied in any of decisions that we're making at the local level. So I, I will stop there, otherwise I'll keep going. Um, William, is, would you like to introduce yourself briefly and, and a little bit um, about the Urban Resilience and Sustainability Clinic? And if not, that's okay too. I, I, of course, Jonathan, thank <laughs> you so much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Great. Well, Jonathan Cohen, thanks for the opportunity to, to, for our students to be before the board. I think I know some of you like Brett. Brett, great to see you again. It's been, it's been a while. Um, but very quickly, uh, I've been teaching in the new Masters of the Environment program for two years. I'm a, a part-time faculty member, but I'm also the lead of what we've called, uh, as of last year, the Urban Resilience and Sustainability Track within this relatively new master's program. And one of the first things I did when I came on board as a faculty member was to reach out to Susie Stripe and Jonathan Cohen to join me uh, as a faculty member. Uh, we also have Harmon Zuckerman and, and Jean Sansom, who are two uh, other terrific folks whom I'm sure some of you know. Um, when the wildfires and COVID came together last summer, uh, last spring and summer in Boulder, Jonathan, Susie, and I got together and said, you know, gosh, how in an age of sort of diminishing public sector resources, but increasing public sector stressors uh, and community stressors, can we serve our community, the city and county of Boulder, with our talented graduate students, as Jonathan noted? And so we came up with this clinic course concept where with a team of 10 students who you'll hear from them in a minute, and Jonathan and Colin and Susie's uh, guidance and, and leadership, we would deliver uh, come April or early May, some value to the city and county in terms of helping guide proposed policy change uh, around a key area, which is air quality and in particular indoor air quality as it affects at-risk communities. That is low-income communities and communities of color in the city of Boulder and Boulder County, um, who between COVID and the wildfires are perhaps the most vulnerable and most exposed. And so that's what's informed the students' work. That's the, the why um, that they bring to tonight's presentation. And I know they've had <clears throat> just about a week to prepare um, and they're still at very early stages of their research and their work with the city and county but um, we really appreciate the opportunity for them to be able to come before you tonight. And so with that, uh, and a, another thanks to Jonathan, 
uh, here are our students. Hey, William, thank you so much for uh, teeing us up. Um, explain our first, actually our first slide very well, you know, kind of go over our mission statement and, you know, what we're trying to do with uh, our two groups. Um, so Caroline, if you mind going to the next slide. Um, so about the project, so we, we split into two teams, um, one looking at, you know, policy programs and codes within the city and county of Boulder, and also a team that's focused on education and outreach. And what we're trying to do is create deliverables that can be then actionable for the city and the county to implement that would improve indoor air quality in an equitable way. Um, so looking at then um, the policy and um, programs team, you know, so we're, we're trying to address IAQ from several different avenues, you know? So the first one we kind of thought of was with building codes, you know, with new buildings, they're already built so well that indoor air quality is not as much of an issue, but with existing buildings, the retrofits, you know, where you have a lot of vulnerable populations existing and dwelling in, you know, you, you have pretty poor indoor air quality and this exacerbates existing conditions. You know, you have vulnerable populations have a higher rate of, you know, asthma and different medical respiratory diseases and poor indoor air quality just does nothing more than exacerbate those issues. So we're looking at building codes and like, it started off with something simple. Could we add PPE to a building in times of wildfire to sort of help people that are within that building protect themselves? Like adding like a mask dispenser. You know, that was like the first idea, but then it's built from there, you know, like what can we do within the existing codes? Like there's buckets when you have to retrofit a home, you know, you have to, do a retrofit measure in a lot of cases? And is there a measure that we can implement that would focus on indoor air quality? Something like, you know, removing your gas stove or, you know, implementing range hoods over your stoves. You know, things along those uh, of that nature was where we're looking with codes. But then also we're looking at existing programs, which are like Energy Smart, Smart Regs, Pace. So for instance, with Energy Smart, um, there's, it's, a, it's, a, it's focusing, focusing mostly on energy efficiency, but you know, there, there, there is some wiggle room that we might be able to implement something with an IAQ lens into the Energy Smart program. And further, you know, we're looking at other areas in which we can approach indoor air quality. You know, there's the sustainability tax, um, which is, I know, a sticky subject, but is there an additional funding source we can add within the sustainability tax that would help landowners and landlords improve their buildings in terms of indoor air quality? to help the public health within Boulder and Boulder County. Um, and finally, uh, we had uh, one of our part, uh, one of our teammates come up with a great idea to potentially forge urban and rural partnerships um, to address fuel loads within the Boulder area. You know, uh, the public lands are taken care of pretty well with the fuel loads when it comes to wildfires, but private land isn't addressed as much, you know? So sort of trying to mitigate or mitigate the, the, the effects of wildfires within the area which also further exacerbate indoor air quality issues. So that's what the uh, actual policy and programs team is looking at. And then we have the education team and our team really has two deliverables that is our goal. And the first one is a lit review, which, are, which is gonna look at two things specifically. So the first one is gonna look at what other cities and communities are doing within the air quality space. And this can include really unique, effective things that other communities are doing um, that have been proven to be really successful. And then we're also gonna look at best practices for public engagement, communication, and education around air quality. And this really has delved into um, doing interviews with people throughout Boulder County who are professionals with kind of engagement with vulnerable communities and then as well as diving deeper into the research that's available online for us to tap into. And our second deliverable is gonna be a GIS interactive story map. For those who don't know who so what story mapping is, is essentially a resource that we can use to be able to pinpoint at granular levels um, ways for us to identify these areas that have high risks of poor air quality. So we are wanting to make something that where residents can have access and uh, find information on what actions they should do if they have these challenges in their home. Um, we will also be adding resources and we will be um, how using or 
addressing the issues on um, if there were a challenge, how can they approach the situation and getting accurate and where they can find accurate um, air quality measures. So we also have a project timeline. We will, we'll, we're gonna start our, our we're gonna finish our um, projects and our uh, research and things like that, March 28th. And then our draft deliverables were, we were advised by April 4th to uh, have those complete. And then our final presentation will be April 28th from four to six. So we will have those done and finalized then. So thank you so much. We appreciate all the time that you guys have given us today. And we are also looking for constructive feedback, ideas, questions, concerns. We are here to help. Great job, Thanks. Caroline. So if anybody's got questions for the team, I know you're on a tight schedule at EAB, but uh, they're here to, um, to respond and to take notes. I do have a question. Uh, this is Marty. Um, the name is my wife's name on, on there, so I'm using her computer. Um, very, very articulate class, by the way. I'm duly impressed. Thank you. Um, my question is, Help me a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm kind of familiar with, with story maps and story lines, so to help communicate a narrative about um, uh, what information means and where it can be accessed. Um, and I guess this question will go to Carolyn, but um, to all of you who, who, who can chime in, please do. What is the difference between a GIS um, story map and a dashboard? where a dashboard might be sort of like a portal that a person can go to do one stop <laughs> shopping. Help me, help me understand that a little bit. Sure, so um, for a story map, you will be able to scroll through and read different, different information that we put on the story map. We can also put onto our story map specific locations where you can click and access the information, um, the accurate, measures and the resources that you may need. Um, this can be a little bit, this can be also uh, a way that's an easier access for people just to read. Um, this could be something that it, it just flows very well and it aligns with the uh, city's plans to create a GIS map that also relates to where um, at a granule level, the neighborhoods that have environmental challenges uh, for example, like heat index, wildfires, um, froze, frozen temperatures and things like that. Um, so we think that this may be a, an easier resource for people to really engage and learn more about their surrounding areas and how they can improve their air quality and their health uh, for their families. Got it. Is, so is the story map a little bit more helping them understand what they're seeing rather than just a loading dock where they can go, oh, here's all these indices and monitoring and time series and that, 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 that. It's overwhelming. Right. And, but you're, you're going to provide a little bit of narration to guide them through and help them absorb what it is they're seeing. Yes, this is correct. It. Very nice. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. I, I guess I have a couple questions or maybe their comments. Um, on the the discussion on you know of building on some of the existing programs like smart regs um that you mentioned you know i think that's a great thing to be looking at as a lot of the ventilation and other health and safety measures i think are already parts of existing energy efficiency programs especially those serving vulnerable communities i guess i'm wondering if, if you guys have considered looking at some of the voluntary offerings as well so rather than the you know cities specific policies, but things like partnering with Energy Outreach of Colorado um, and other organizations that are, are sort of already in people's homes, providing some of these resources to think about ways to piggyback um, some of the air quality things you're thinking about on top of, you know, energy efficiency or other health and safety measures. No, that's an excellent question because, you know, we, we, had, we hadn't looked into those voluntary measures as of yet. Um, we had been mostly focusing on, you know, like you said, the Energy Smart, the Smart Reg programs as an avenue to address indoor air quality. But, um, you know, for these voluntary measures, that could be another great avenue for us to look at. 
um, and see what they have going on at the moment and see what they can, what can be put into their programs that could address indoor air quality. So that that's actually really helpful yeah, for us. Yeah, suggest looking at it. I mean, it's stuff they're they're already working on. Um, I know maybe less related to wildfire, but more just other uh, indoor health issues. Um, and, and then just, I guess Justin and Duncan, just before you go on, Justin, if you would be willing, uh, the teams are still in somewhat of a discovery phase. So um, if say Duncan might uh, be able to follow up with you, just Justin, for a half hour to. Sort of yeah, no, brain on some of these happy, programs. That would happy be happy to chat about it or put you in Great. touch with folks um, at RNG Outreach Colorado who could answer in more depth. Um, that would be, sure. That'd be That'd awesome. Be, That'd Thank be awesome. You. Thank you. Um, and then I guess, you know, just another question is wondering if you're thinking about sort of broadly, if there's a role, you know, we, I guess, have presented to council and I think there was some interest on their part in just thinking through, you know, is there a role for sort of community um, centers to help folks during times of challenging air quality, you know, a role for the city in terms of providing refuge. So I guess wondering if you guys have been thinking about those types of things as well, if that's within the scope and, and if not, I might suggest adding it. That's another item that I think we have missing from our scope. And again, I, I think, you know, that's something that could be really, really valuable. Um, in times of wildfire. So that's something, again, we can look at. Appreciate you, Justin, for actually highlighting those two items because they're definitely missing from our list. Great. I had a brief question as well for you guys. Um, are you planning on any sort of um, monitoring of the levels of air quality in the indoors? And, and how are you measuring the success of accomplishing reductions in, air, in impacts indoors? So our team is put, oh. Duncan, yeah, I can are. take that one with the okay. airflow. Yeah. So um, we, I had just heard from a Capstone team member that she had been working on a project with IO Airflow and NREL. So she was going to try and set us up with contact with the CEO and see how that relationship could build. Um, otherwise for any additional sensors, I think we had been looking at like different public networks. I think purple was discussed, mm -hmm. um, but otherwise we don't have any concrete plans for sensors currently. And to build off what Hannah was saying, you know, we're, we're developing a list of recommendations mostly um, for the city to implement. Um, we're using a lot of data as well from um, Shelly, um, I can't remember, Miller, I think, uh, that uh, has Shelley done Miller some, at CU. Yes. Yeah, has done a bunch of indoor air quality, um, you know, testing within uh, vulnerable populations in Boulder and has discovered, you know, where a lot of the pollutants come from. So like, you know, outdoor air infiltration and, um, you know, a lot of your equipment, but also VOC emitting paints and carpets, you know, so there, there's a lot of data out there. So I don't know if we're going to do as much data collection as we are going to take the existing data and try to synthesize that and create recommendations for the county to pursue as it pertains indoor air quality. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Brandon, this is Colin. The, the actual monitoring may be out of scope for, for this clinic. Um, but uh, there are a lot of parallel efforts um, that, that could be synthesized and a couple of, a couple of grant applications are in um, for indoor air quality monitoring. And so should that happen, then there's some, some dovetailing that could take place with what the students are doing. Great. Susan, I think you were trying to get in a question. You're, you're muted, Susan. The perennial, you're still muted. Right. First of all, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have new faces and new energy here to even, this evening. And um, I was really interested in your title, The Intersection of Air Quality Issues and Vulnerable Populations, because one aspect of vulnerability is our low income populations who perhaps can least afford some of the measures that we're talking about, um, particularly in their own spaces. And a large percentage of that community generally are renters. So I wondered if you'd thought through programs um, to make both monitoring and air cleaning systems more available to low income people and um, particularly programs with landlords um, to create safer indoor spaces. We've actually started looking into that. Um, a, a, an area of or an avenue which we're like looking at it right now is the sustainability tax within Boulder. You know, there, there's multiple buckets within the tax 
that you know allocate money to different sustainability measures. And we're wondering if there's another bucket that could be created that would um, create like a grant style funding source for land owners and landlords where they could put together, you know, they, they could help matching grant style, you know, make improvements to their dwellings or their households that would improve the indoor air quality. And, you know, there, there's a lot of things you can do that are pretty simple that, um, you know, could quickly improve indoor air quality. You know, um, a lot of these affordable dwelling units are located really close to roadways, you know, you know, high traffic roadways. And you see a lot of air infiltration becoming a, a, a huge issue for indoor air quality. So could you somehow, you know, like air sealing is one of those topics that's talked a lot about for energy um, conservation or energy uh, efficiency. So that could be another measure that could be looked at for indoor air quality improvements. There's also things like adding the proper sweeps or improving your existing ceiling around your openings that could improve those, the air infiltration. Those are just some of the ideas we're looking at, but we have sort of looking at, um, you know, creating funding for landlords to draw from to improve their um, house or their renters housing. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Susan, it's such a great question. This is William Shutkin. Um, and it's, it's a constant theme for this clinic course and for much of our work and my, and my work, affordability and inclusion, as well as environmental quality. How do we make it work? Um, so a couple of add-ons to what Duncan said. And in fact, I think Duncan, it was your idea initially. You know, what if uh, every Thistle or Boulder Housing Partners community had on hand an emergency supply of PPE for acute air quality events? Like, a, I think Duncan used the analogy of a fire extinguisher. What if there were a similar compartment in buildings, perhaps required by code or not, uh, that were available, simple mitigation measures? Um, we came across the idea through Shelley Miller of, a, of fan banks. These are banks that loan uh, for free uh, fans during acute air quality events to improve ventilation and cooling uh, for folks who otherwise couldn't afford a fan. And it's a, essentially a revolving bank. Um, and imagine the uh, story map that Caroline so well described, uh, pointing out in one of its resource uh, uh, pages, you know, where these, these fan banks were located and how to make use of them. Um, so these are the sorts of tangible, practical, hopefully low cost to no cost measures that uh, the students are researching into in a very rapid fashion to be able to advise the city and county decision makers um, on ways to learn from COVID and the wildfire season and then take action that's perhaps uh, of, a, of a prototypical nature, um, but something that could be implemented. I just want to throw in that last fall, one of our colleagues in the department, Elizabeth Pisaka, contracted with a group out of uh, Oakland called the Mycelium Youth Network, who have been working with youth to put on uh, workshops for communities of color around how to build sort of a do-it-yourself air filtration system. So you can take these 20 inch fans, for example, and just strap an air filter on the front of them and it significantly improves. So for 30 or $35, you can create a system that can help uh, those households be able to filter there and not just keep themselves cool, which is of course, when we start to get into these convergences of extreme heat plus fire, we're gonna have really, really toxic conditions because people need to stay in their homes, but they can't stay cool. So I think that's one thing to, to kind of watch for. And also, especially this, how we empower communities to empower themselves. Um, and I think this, this youth of color providing workshops in their own communities has been a very effective model. Mm -hmm. So another thing I would point to is, especially as you start thinking about codes, <clears throat> certainly the, the, and this Carolyn's gonna talk about this, that the, one of the significant benefits of electrification with heat pumps is that you can enable households to have cooling without it being outside air that's brought in, which typical refrigerant coolers are bringing outside air in. So it's a very important benefit. And I think in the fights that are now underway, largely because of the natural gas industry, trying to stop communities who are trying to go all electric, the health of benefits may be one of the most important selling points there. And then the last thing I'll just note, this is kind of a shocking and disruptive statement, but 
in the, in a conversation we had with some building designers a couple of years ago about this, one of the inclinations in the codes is to start putting in requirements for sort of um, fancy heat exchange air uh, systems, which are great when they work, but in experience that it's been had in things like Habitat for Humanity houses, where they require these uh, fancy air exchange systems to be put in, they forget that there's maintenance that's required. And these units are often put in some place where they are not very visible. And so fairly quickly, the, the filters get caked up and then pretty soon they're not actually very functional at all. And uh, from a colleague who's a very interesting character out in, North, in Northern California, they did some analysis that showed that relatively leaky houses that had really strong hood vents and bathroom vents they were pulling air from the outside with all the, the, the doors and windows closed. We're actually creating a particulate filtration system through essentially the leaks in their houses that was as good or better as many of the filtration systems. So we just have to be thoughtful about when we use technology solutions, especially that, that we're actually factoring in all the factors that are going to be necessary to making sure that they work. Brent, I wonder if I can ask one more question to follow up on last week's conversation on electrification, um, which was um, the, the question I was kind of posing, I want to come back to, which has to do with mobility, electrification of our mobility. So if you will, electric vehicles rather than, than gasoline or diesel vehicles. Um, and so here I'm, I'm thinking in the spirit of, the, of a clinic, which is this class, and defining the problem related to electrification mobility as concerns air quality. And, and my question has to do with this. So if I'm living along Foothills Highway or, and there's plenty of communities long and, and well-to-do communities, these aren't impoverished people living uh, along Foothills Highway or uh, along the Longmont Diagonal. So they're with an eye shot, um, the constant stream of gasoline engine cars. Do we have an idea about what the air quality is in that corridor of neighborhoods, as opposed to communities that are set back from these main thoroughfares? So do we know a baseline, you know, how much worse is the air quality just from the current mobility based on the gasoline engine? Um, and how much improvement might we expect as we consistently move to electrification for the air quality along these thoroughfare corridors? That, that would be a sort of a measure of, you know, the, the solution to the problem that the clinic would be interested to survey. Not in your class time, obviously, but as a long-term project. That's great. Well, Jerry, that's such a- uh, uh, Yeah, Marty, Marty. Uh, Marty, uh, sorry, not Jerry. You. That's good. Uh, but that's such a wonderful example for all of us of systems thinking, right? Connecting up these different systems and, and processes uh, uh, under one you know, sort of common problem set. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, we've been talking in this clinic class about electrification a lot. Um, Connecting it up to, to EV, not, not yet, but to the extent that, as I think Duncan mentioned, uh, experts like Shelley Miller from CU suggest that indeed the, the biggest air quality problem for low income communities are the air emissions from vehicles on, on heavily trafficked uh, arteries. So I have no doubt that a really good hypothesis would be as soon as we you know, electrify uh, our vehicle fleets, uh, we will no doubt see you know dramatic improvements in air quality. Now there'll still be right uh, a, a grid that's not uh, necessarily fully clean, uh, at least in the near term. But hopefully by 2030, when we see this new fleet really turning over, we'll see dramatic effects. You know, it might be something teams that that we know sort of this connection between the the transportation technologies and the air quality problem. I'm not sure. Uh, Marty, it's something we're going to be able to necessarily address in, in this particular assignment. Yeah, it's a big, great, big a really good thought and something to, to be addressed going forward. Thanks, thanks, William. Um, I, I guess this is a question, Justin. Would you mind if I made a comment? Just following rules of protocol. <laughs> Go for it, Jonathan. Thank you. I appreciate it. 
Um, just a couple of comments and maybe a bit of a segue into the next part of your conversation related to the codes. And first of all, I just want to appreciate and um, all of the students and William, you in particular, for kind of your willingness to partner with us on, on this kind of new and unique way of thinking. Um, it's been really extraordinary. And, and I think you can all see just the the, the brain trust that we have that sometimes we don't utilize like we should in these students. Um, and so just a couple comments here that I, I wanted to make. I think it was Duncan who made reference to some mapping that we are embarking on. And, and I just wanted to whet the board's appetite a little bit that we'll be coming back to you in the in somewhat near future. Um, working with Colin in the county and Paul Shanowski at the university to start to dive deeper into this vulnerability mapping. And this is prompted, I think, Susan, by your question. Um, in really understanding a level of granularity or resolution in terms of the vulnerabilities that exist within a community, I think we kind of think of them as homogenized, right? We think of Boulder, oh yeah, your risks are um, flooding, wildfire, and this and that, but really diving deep into neighborhood level data and understanding then how that informs the policy decisions that we make, the programs that we might be able to service and offer. Um, and I think that that is something we are really excited to be doing with the county and also the city of Longmont. So stay tuned for how we start to lay that out. The other piece that I wanted to reference, I think Brett had teed this up in my mind, just utilizing the networks that are already out there as we think about some of these solutions. So Brett mentioned the work of Elizabeth Fasaka, who is our equity uh, manager within our climate initiatives department, connecting with our uh, overall racial equity framework at the city, and then use, utilizing those partnerships like flows at CU and Boulder Housing Partners in the county to start to really infiltrate and be able to test and model some of these solutions in ways that the city perhaps can't always do. And so that's something really exciting to look forward to. Um, and then I had one other piece that I think I am just losing at the moment, um, and I apologize. Um, yeah, I'll just I'll just stop there and say, oh, I know what it was. The the other piece, um, Susan, that you made me think of is it's not just looking forward and what we can offer, but also looking at what we're currently doing. And so part of our overall strategy, particularly on the equity and air quality framework is doing a bit of an equity scan. So looking at our current programs and services, looking at what we're doing right now and being able to identify the inequity and looking at the things where we can improve upon what we're already doing. So I know that that's just a little bit of a nuance, but I think it's a really critical one. Instead of just saying, let's just keep adding more and more, it's, wow, we could really refine and tinker with the things that we're doing it right now to kind of pick up some of these other issues that are, are, are I think, growing importance. So I'll stop there. I know you have a lot left on your agenda and we wanna make that pivot. And I wanna make sure that the students can get onto the rest of their evening too. Great, thanks to Jonathan and thanks again to everyone from the Masters of Environment program. It was really helpful and I guess, I hope you guys will come back and talk to EAB again once your work is finalized, though I will not be here to listen to it. Where, where will you be? Are you terming off or something? Yeah, I guess you missed that. This is my last meeting. I'm, uh, oh, I'm, shoot. I'm uh, my, well, my stay you, on Justin. EAB is coming to an end. Thank, thanks for doing that for, for all of us. So we'll invite uh, all of the EAB board members, including you, Justin, to the April 28th presentation, which Jonathan and I and Colin and Susie will be organizing with the students. Um, so we'll look forward to seeing you then. Thanks, great. everybody. And great, great job, students. Thank you. Thank yeah, you, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Well, I guess that sort of segs into the next piece of our agenda, which is thinking about com communications with council or sort of where I think the board goes next on this, um, on the issue of air quality. Is that right, Brett? And I don't know, is there something you wanna say to introduce the topic or? Um, uh, yeah, well, Miriam? maybe one one thing I'd maybe like to suggest, see if you'd be willing to do a little bit of a jump of um, agenda items just briefly. I happen to know personally how many meetings Jonathan has to go to and how many of them are late. And I would rather not have him have to be here the whole rest of the evening. And so uh, I think the only other reason why we wanted you here, Jonathan, was just, I think you had a little bit of insight for the board about 
the process of both the EAB's evolution and the process of how boards are being encouraged sort of to be a little bit more proactive and then also this issue about working with other boards. So if you're willing, could you give us that update and then maybe we could let you go home. <laughs> Thanks, Brett. Yeah, looks like he's already home. Well, that's yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah, so no, thanks. I, I appreciate that. That's that's super helpful. And let me just start by saying I, I so appreciate this is um, a, a really great topic. And Justin, uh, you did such a fantastic job representing the board at the city council retreat, which really prompted, I think, and invoked a great conversation amongst directors um, and departments in terms of how can we improve on the current process be, to to create that space for interdepartmental work um, and interboard work. So I think this interesting topic um, that Marty brings up around vehicle emissions is a perfect topic to, to, to find that intersection between the transportation department and climate initiatives tab in the EAB and not just centering on uh, VMT, but the thing that kind of binds us together, which is this health implications and the air quality implications. And, those cross-cutting topics become very, very relevant and in interesting when we create a space to discuss them amongst uh, kind of the different work groups and of course the boards and commissions. So what I wanted to share with you is again, I think the, the conversation that was prompted at the city council retreat and then of course by um, this board's um, letter to the council was, to create more collaboration amongst the boards. How do we make that happen? How do we be very intentional about that? Is it something that looks like all of the boards coming together, one representative from each board coming together in some type of grand summit? Uh, we have 22 boards and commissions, it's a lot. And so what is the best way to try to find that intersectionality and find the space to, for this work to, to occur? So I don't have the solution for you tonight. I don't, I'm not able to report out on that, but what I am able to share with you is uh, that directors are very actively discussing this. And I think the hope is within the next month or two to be able to roll out a bit of a framework uh, for the boards to kind of move into a space in a very intentional way that I don't, I, at least in my tenure with the city, which is 15 years, that I have ever seen or witnessed. So it's a very, very positive uh, conversation that's taking place right now, really starting to do a deep dive into the types of activities that the boards are really interested in, uh, flagging some of these, these topics like air quality, health, equity, resilience, that don't, that don't necessarily reside with one board, uh, nor, nor should they, uh, but being able to explore um, how it might show up in terms of the recommendations each of the boards are making. And, and I, the last thing I will say here is that it gave me an opportunity to kind of talk about where we believe we are heading, I think in terms of our department and starting to look at some of the systems work that's so critical to the success and uh, in our ability to kind of address climate issues and kind of link those to community-based values. And, and so starting to think about some of the tough choices and issues that we're going to have to be dealing with, like land use policies, um, like some of the issues related to broad based ecosystems work that Brett is championing. How do we think about equity in this space uh, from a climate perspective? How do we think about some of the very difficult conversations that that we've just kind of lightly touched over the years and really starting to focus in and utilizing that climate lens. Um, and it's been very positive. And I think it's been um, incredible to see the, re the receptiveness of the other departments, of the directors and uh, of the city manager. And it was something that we discussed with both of the city manager candidates in terms of how they see the role of, of their citizen boards and commissions and how we better utilize them moving forward. So I, I'll stop and take any questions or comments that you have. I appreciate the opportunity. I didn't have anything prepared on this. So Brett kind of caught me off guard, but, uh, um, but I'd love to hear any comments or thoughts that you have and any feedback on that and anything you want me to make sure is included in the conversations over the next couple of months. So Jonathan, I, I would just add that uh, in the past, we've had the opportunity to have the joint sessions with the different boards on topics that are of great importance to us and getting the perspectives of the different boards I felt was 
really helpful to to sort of guide our our conversation and and where we wanted to go with it. Um, so if we can continue to be able to do that, it would be important, I think. Could, could I ask you a question back, Miriam? I I completely agree with that. I'm wondering one of the things that I think I have been trying to think through is, you know, coming together um, with multiple boards, what's the topic that you really want to dig into? Uh, sometimes, at least in my experience, the board, there's been something that's really, I think, been under the purview and ownership of, say, the EAB, and you're trying to get a perspective from some of the other boards versus it, would it be beneficial to kind of create a master list of these broader topics like air quality, like equity and resilience, that we could bring the boards and commissions together and they each kind of bring their perspective roles um, and expertise to that conversation, or maybe it's both. And, and maybe there's a nuance there that that is unnecessary, but I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts are there. I, I think you hit it on the head. I, that's exactly a great way to, to approach it, I think. And, and the way, you know, the experience that I had was with ecosystems as a topic and, and that brought in a bunch of different perspectives from a bunch of different boards, um, you know, managing in the ecosystem space. I mean, we could do that with climate, we could do it with equity and resilience, we could do it with any number of, of topics, really, that goes under our purview, but lands in a lot of different laps, I think. Um, Thank you. This is, this is Marty, real quick, as a, as a, uh, what topic to dig into, you, you asked Jonathan, it's a great question. I wonder if they were prepared in Texas for the cascading vulnerabilities that were exposed by a cold wave. I wonder if there had been conversations among councils in San Antonio, for instance, or Austin, about what would happen if something like this even conceivably could occur to cascade on losing electricity and losing water, uh, losing mobility, losing it all. Where in Boulder do we have that, that we haven't yet conversed about, that maybe we're a little bit too comfortable about our vulnerability that actually is lurking and just waiting to be triggered by something? What have we forgotten? I think that's well, it happened with the floods, didn't it? <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> not as much as it could have, but it could. you're right, it could have gone there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Marty, it's such an excellent question, and I think just just Miriam to your your um, response about the floods. I think there are these acute shocks that cause us to look at, oh my goodness, what happens if we experience this again? And this is where I I am just going to be very very. Uh, I'm going to make a strong statement here that I think resilience is a topic that we have not yet truly dug into as an organization, as a community. Um, and really looked at it from all different angles. I think our resilience strategy is, is a great start, but we've not applied this lens of really what are these types of, of impacts, these shocks and stressors and the cascading effect that may come from them. Uh, I know internally our department has had a number of conversations on the energy side of things, but you know you can piece this apart and say, my gosh, there were failures all over the place in terms of public health and emergency operations centers and protecting our vulnerable populations and you know that there are financial impacts. And so looking at it from all of those dimensions, I think begins to see a, a, a different story emerges. So I think that community resilience and really understanding what that looks like is such a critical piece. And it's often prompted by some of these disasters that we see take place either in our region or in others. Yeah. You know, one thing that just real quick on the Texas story, um, in terms of inequity by, by poverty, the folks that couldn't get out of harm's way, they couldn't get into a car, they couldn't get out of their homes, they couldn't find family that could shelter them. Uh, they didn't have a network of friends that had enough space to accommodate them in a warm environment. I can see the same happening in Boulder in a situation of some catastrophe where suddenly that we recognize that there are people who are isolated, who have no place to go. And that's where the city resources need to be directed, not to those of us that have a nice big home and family that live in another home elsewhere in another community, we can go to, we can get a hotel room for six months and pay for it. You know, no, that's not the problem. We're trying to protect those that don't have any of that. Yeah. And Great mapping point. where those folks are and then figuring out what costs can we cover 
whatever, if that's financial, whatever it may be, as support to buy, provide a backstop, an insurance policy for them, that we are their family, that they can be assured and don't have to be fretting about a consequence that they saw unfold in Texas. Should never be something that a person loses sleep over. I'm going to go back and, and pull out that recording. I love that. The way you just said that is was so beautiful. I, thank you. Susan, I see your hand. Yeah, I just um, wanted to comment. I, I think part of the issue is just the way our organizational structure is set up. You know, like right now, if I'm not mistaken, our responsibility as a board is to give information and insight to city council when they ask us. So it's like each board has a responsibility to city council, but there's nothing in our organizational structure that creates any kind of matrix or intersectionality between the boards. And so, you know, I think, you know, I've just been of my own volition attending the planning board meetings and reading a little bit about land use code. And from my environment, with my environmental advisory board hat on, I'm like, oh, wow. Urban heat islands is one of the things we want to work on. And this project looks like one giant urban heat island to me, but I don't really have any kind of formalized way to speak up about that at planning board because I'm just, as far as they're concerned, another member of the public. Um, and I'm sure there's lots of other great, great examples of that. You know, our intersection with the Transportation Advisory Board and the Water Resources Board, et cetera. But there's no really um, organizational or communication structure set up to facilitate that, you know? So I'd like to see that addressed. This is one bit of feedback, Jonathan, just about, you asked a question earlier about the sort of breadth versus depth, at least that's one of the ways to interpret what you asked. And I think in my experience of these joint advisory board meetings too, um, that both we have had from the EAB's perspective or that we've gone to, if say transportation did, advisory board did one, that the ones that, are, that try to cover too much end up feeling like they're sort of really nice conversations that don't really get much traction as opposed to the ones that choose a, an issue or a few issues that are really salient as intersections and then can go deep. So that would be the first bit of feedback. And the second is, I just wanna again commend this board that it has taken on several issues and I think has really advanced them in terms of the cities being aware of and working on them like air quality. And I think air quality, urban heat, um, sort of resilience, these are our issues that don't really have a strong home yet. And that I think this board is kind of helping raise that set of issues for the, for the organization. The, the last comment, sorry, go can ahead. I, can I add to that? Yes. Sorry. Okay, I, I, you know, I, I think it's great to have sort of point in time meetings when the boards get together. But I also think it would be great if we had an organizational structure where it became more common for any board to say, wow, I wonder um, what they're doing about this in the transportation advisory board. Here's the mechanism between inner board meetings. Here's the mechanism where we get on their agenda to talk about this and maybe have two or three team members form you know, a little working group or something. But we just don't really have those mechanisms in place that are more um, malleable, you know, not just like waiting for, oh, we're gonna have some big board meeting where we all come together, but rather facilitate communications in between. Yeah, like a, a regular communication channel, I think could be pretty, pretty good. I, I do think that this is the point though, where we have to be watchful of a line that, that sort of de delineates between an advisory board and an action group or a sort of task force. The advisory boards are not task forces that were formed to do specific things. They, they were advisory bodies set up to advise both council and staff on the things that the city organization is trying to do. And so I think we have been blurring that line a little bit intentionally um, by encouraging, especially this board to 
to be somewhat proactive, but I do think we have to be watchful. And John, then I guess I would look to you for a little bit more feedback on this particular issue. Yeah, well, let me just let me just say this is and I appreciate the way you kind of described it earlier in terms of the the, the historic and somewhat traditional approach um, that we have utilized for boards to provide feedback and guidance to city council versus kind of the peripheral do of being able to inform one another. I mean, when I say one another, the the, the citizen boards and commissions. So I, I just I guess I come down in a place that perhaps is a is a little bit less traditional. Um, I agree with you, Brett, though. I think that some identifying some of these cross-cutting issues uh, are, are critically important and allowing the boards to bring their expertise and kind of color in their particular part of some of these big community-based issues. What I am sensing and feeling, and, and this is why I perhaps am, am straying a little bit further than what you just said, Brett, is uh, I think we have a number of new directors in, in the city um, who are eager to try to do things a little less traditionally to say, well, maybe just because that's the way we've done it, maybe that doesn't need to be how we move forward. And can we maybe test and model a different approach in, in some sense? Now, we need to get it right and we need to try hard to make sure that we're addressing some of the unintended consequences. But what I am sensing in the conversations I've been part of are, I think, ones where we can come together in, in a little bit different way. And I would really love to see a way, and I think Brent has been a very good champion here too, to say, you know, how do we stretch a little bit? Um, there are certain lanes that boards and commissions need to stay in, but when can we perhaps maybe ride the line a little bit? And when can we kind of support one another in a different way? I'm using the we in a probably um, ineffective way. We meaning like this board and that board. And um, so I think it's just some literacy building. It's the ability to kind of um, model some different behaviors than at least I've experienced. And I think there's a willingness to do that. Um, so I don't have a, a great answer for you tonight, uh, though I don't know what the exact question was, except to say um, I, would, I would look to perhaps some new opportunities in the coming months. Um, and that would be something that is maybe coming from city leadership, coming from the city manager's office, and maybe moving throughout the various boards and commissions looking for some new opportunities. Uh, and that's why that I think that's what prompted my response to all of you last uh, or a couple of weeks ago, just to say, um, I want to make sure that that is sanctioned kind of across the organization and it doesn't look like one board is trying to kind of push a new narrative and a new process and way of doing things. Um, Brett, I don't know if that answered your question necessarily. I'm sorry. Well, I do, I do want to say one thing um, for the board, which is, I think you would understand and probably already expect this, but um, as an organization, we are extremely stretched right now. I mean, we had downsizing. We have, um, we actually heard about a little bit more layoffs today from a, a certain department. We have a hiring freeze. Um, so there's a huge amount of fatigue and um, just, you know, people are really at their edge. And so what will not go over well is if people keep identifying new issues that they're interested in seeing us do something about and we're having a really hard time staying on top of what we're doing. So I would just be wanting to encourage the board. That's why these, the letter to the council to, to really say, here's the things that we're gonna be especially looking at, that those are the kinds of things that I would say, yes, let's watch for the, the interconnectedness and the crossover with other boards. But if we start adding a whole bunch of new issues and suddenly I think we should be working on this, it's gonna not go well just because of the stress within the organization to try to respond to what we're doing. That's a great addition, Brad. I'm sorry, I kind of missed, missed the point of your, your question. I appreciate you adding that and I, I couldn't agree more. Could I make another comment? Or, or yeah, actually, a specific suggestion. So Brett, as, as you described it, the role of the advisory board is to advise council and advise staff. But again, it seems to me just in listening to other board meetings that there are times when it would be appropriate for a board to ask another board for advice or for a board to advise, you know, as I'm listening to planning board, I'm thinking, 
gosh, why don't they ask the Environmental Advisory Board or the Transportation Advisory Board about the impacts of this instead of the, the hierarchy right now is that that request would go through council or through staff. So to me, that's the, the missing leg in the three-legged stool is that advisory boards can advise city council and advisory boards can advise staff, but there's no mechanism for advisory boards to advise one another. Yeah, and, and I, I thank you and I appreciate that. I would just wanna do, I wanna to try to make a little bit of a differentiation. And this, maybe we could use the urban heat as a really good example. I think for, for the environmental advisory board to signal to the planning board that urban heat is an issue that you believe is very significant and going to be more and more significant and that you think we need to be really looking at our mechanisms and capabilities as an organization to consider and, and incorporate that is one thing and a very useful sort of signal. So, oh, then they, the, the planning board might say, well, that's interesting. What do you have that you're doing around that? As opposed to uh, us saying, well, we think that project that you're currently reviewing has an urban heat problem and you need to talk to us about that project. We've been there a few times before and that, that will not go well. No, I totally agree with you. Yeah. So I'm sorry to belabor this, or I don't think we were belabored. I think this is a really important point and there's no absolutely crisp lines on this. And so I think we'll continue to have these kind of conversations, but I, I, most of all, I just want to say again, I, I so appreciate and I'm grateful for the passion and commitment that you as board members bring that you want to bring your best to this work and to our community. So thank you. Ditto. So uh, if, if we have, I think any other uh, probings and comments we want to give to Jonathan before we let this poor man go? <laughs> I love being here. It's, it's, I, I really enjoy spending time with all of you. Some of you may know I inherited the Environmental Advisory Board from Jonathan. So, <laughs> and you're looking on who you can pass it off to. Yeah, somewhat <laughs> reluctantly, but <laughs> I, but I, I will tell you, Brett is a definite champion of this board. So you, you have a good advocate there. I heard you say, Jonathan, that you want to be with us. So can we put him on the board? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a conflict. You don't want that. <laughs> I can imagine in his retirement, Jonathan, like really angling for his opportunity to be on the environmental advisor. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I All live right. in fear of what happens when Jonathan retires. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, we, we, are, we are getting on in our evening. So let's let Jonathan go yeah. and we can move on. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Great to see you all. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Have a good night. You too. Okay, um, so do you want to circle back to air quality or should we move on to beneficial electrification so we could also uh, let Carolyn have some of her evening back? I think that would be a great idea too. I do, I do think if, we are, if we're going to do that, which I totally support, I do want to come back around because, and I'll give, actually give Carolyn the choice here. Carolyn and I have been kind of tag teaming as staff around this air quality issue because we don't have a clear mandate or work plan item around this. We do believe that it's important. Uh, I also support Carolyn getting a chance because she goes to a lot of late meetings too. So, but I do want to come back to like next steps around the air quality piece. So Carolyn, what's your preference? No, I, I don't feel like I'm escaping. So don't <laughs> worry about that piece. Um, you know, I bring a different context um, around the air quality issue when we talk about beneficial electrification. Um, so I don't know if that's um, a, an input that you might want to want, um, take into your consideration in our discussions. Yeah. Um, so I, I could do the quick presentation and then we could focus both on, you know, the topics I think uh, Miriam and Colin have been very focused on around our, out, um, you know, wildfire and other climate related events, as well as, you know, I think this is the role buildings play both as in terms of um, their contributing role to air quality issues, as well as their opportunity um, to present safe harboring um, during some of these climate related events. So. I think I heard her say that she'd like to go ahead and give her presentation and if she felt- that And then stick around. Yeah. And then I'm sticking around, yeah. <laughs> as long as you promise to finish around eight. I'm curious about your background. My background? No, not, not work-wise, just Zoom, your Zoom background. Oh, I am in, um, <laughs> um, I have a story. 
there is a story. Brett, it seemed like there would be. Brett, do you still have yours? I, I do. Uh, maybe I'll go get mine while you're talking about yours. Um, so uh, sadly, on Friday of last week, um, Brett and Jonathan and I, um, I mean, it was a celebratory opportunity to thank one of our long-term colleagues for her many years of contribution to the city, but it was her retirement party. And um, it was Kara Mertz. I think many of you uh, know Kara Mertz having led our zero waste um, programs as well as many other um, significant programs for the city. And so because of COVID, you know, we can't necessarily be together um, for our celebrations. And so one of our colleagues managed to get pictures from throughout Kara's home. <laughs> And when we um, launched our Zoom party for her, we all had on our respective backgrounds from her home. So I am in Kara's office and Brett is in Kara's Airstream. And boy, did it freak her out before she understood that we weren't actually there. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> and That's what funny. I discovered is my, my weird fake background somehow it lights me better at night. That's and a really so good thing. That's I'm going to remain in Kara's home. That's good. Well, that yeah, that's really clever. I'm uh, impressed. And I figured there was some story. I was just confused. I was like, how is it daylight where she is? Yeah, right. Know, right? Why? <laughs> <laughs> it's not one of those can zoom backgrounds. You know, my colleagues have things like beaches and such, but mine yeah. is, is um, Kara's. This is Kara Merkel's home office. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, that's great. I don't want to derail the conversation. Too. No, I appreciate it. But yes. Um, with that, you know, we need to think about, you know, healthy and um, yeah, clean and healthy homes. <laughs> um, so I do have a few slides. Um, Heidi, which is better for me to try and project or for you to do it? Okay. At outstanding. I like this solution. Um, so Heidi, next slide. I'll just go ahead and quickly go through this. So yeah, so thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Carolyn Elam. I'm the energy manager in our uh, climate initiatives department. And I wanted to talk a little bit about some of our strategies around our buildings, um, both in, in, in the context of electrification, but why electrification? And so we frequently have talked about the role buildings play in emissions, um, both in terms of our electricity consumption and, and gas consumption. And so I just wanted to show you of kind of the changing landscape of um, emissions and where electrification really um, comes into play from the emissions perspective. So on the left, um, I have our current distribution of emissions um, from our inventories, which show you know the largest portion is electricity. That's still largely from buildings, um, but you know we know that um, you know recent announcements from Excel, our own community objectives around 100% renewable electricity, really tackle that electricity part. And so I'm showing the chart on the right and Marty, you'll appreciate the, both the transportation component here as well as the natural gas. Like this is where the balance of our emissions are gonna come and, and where we really need to be focusing our, our programs. And so natural gas use in buildings is, you know, close, not quite 50%, but it's a significant portion of our residual emissions that we need to tackle just to hit our targets. Um, next slide, Heidi. Um, but as we've come to appreciate, and I think Brett's alluded to and has come up in our conversations with Miriam, Buildings play another contributing role to our um, environmental challenges that we face. And I thought this study from California, it was really fascinating to, to think about because we don't typically think of our buildings as emitters. Um, <clears throat> and so California did this study and it supports um, some of the things you've heard from them around their natural gas bans of really looking at the role of buildings and homes as compared to power plants, right? We think of power plants as significant emitters we have um, regulation in place to manage that. Um, and the study just shows, you know, how many more times the, the buildings contribute and they're unregulated. The appliances operating in those buildings are not regulated from an air emission standpoint perspective. And so they're really contributing significantly to a lot of our ozone issues we're seeing today. So even as we electrify our transportation sector, we still have to concern ourselves with what we're doing um, in terms of our buildings. Heidi, next slide. So we wanted to just touch a little bit, um, and I don't have a ton of slides, I just wanted to tee this up so we could have conversation. Um, but we're really tackling this um, from the city perspective from a number of different avenues. I'll talk a little bit more about our building codes, but our community is committed to net zero building codes by 2031 for all new construction and major renovations where 
you know, a major renovation is like a home gut or a building complete renovation. Um, we have policy and regulatory for, for, um, action in terms of um, building performance goals, um, other considerations that we can talk about. We are also doing voluntary incentives to help our early adopters as they want to achieve our climate goals themselves and contribute to that. And then I, I very clearly say to be determined because I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to mutually talk about you know, what those strategies and tactics should be going forward. Heidi, next slide. So um, I'm gonna talk about building codes um, and a little bit of background context for this. And Heidi, you can go to the next slide is I know there's a lot, been a lot of conversation in our community recently and in the past around the natural gas bans um, and what's been evolving in California, Massachusetts and some other locations around um, outright banning natural gas infrastructure and new development. And we haven't gone there um, as a community yet. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. One is, um, you know, if you really think about the material impacts that those types of bans are having, they're, they're fairly limited because um, what's your definition of, of new construction and new development in the terms of a, a community like Boulder where there's very little new developable space. Um, and so we're really talking about, you know, a few areas of redevelopment um, that can be impacted by such a ban. And then um, thinking about also where some of our other tactics are already getting us. And so I wanted to just feature our residential building codes right now. And I apologize, I have not updated this chart to show where we're at today, but it is that orange line. Um, our current building codes, um, energy fish, um, Ener Boulder's Energy Conservation Code um, is at that orange line where we are requiring net zero um, for anything over 3000 square feet. And for perspective, this is almost every new single family, well, it actually is pretty much every single new fam uh, single family home in Boulder that's been constructed, um, has to be net zero. And so one of the nuances, and we point to this line um, around the 20, and, and the, the left side is showing you the, um, what's called the HER scores or the ener um, energy use per square footage kind of metric. When you get crossing over that line at 20, a second piece comes into play, which is our interconnection rules around solar. So the way you get to net zero is you put enough solar on your home to offset the energy use within your home, right? As soon as you kind of cross that 20 threshold, you have to essentially electrify your appliances because you can't put in a large enough solar system under our current limitations to offset that natural gas use. And so what we've seen as we've been evolving this code um, in the prior one, I'm still showing the 2017, which was when the code was introduced about 50% of our new construction single family homes were going in with all electric heating and cooling. So we were already um, making that transition and driving it simply through this um, uh, performance based metric around how much energy that home could use. So I think that's really important. So our code is really already affecting kind of the change we want and we're still allowing people I mean, I think this is an important thing when we talk about the air quality issue, the indoor air quality issue. We've still been allowing people to choose gas as a, um, as a feature in their home, just not for their heating and cooling, right? So from an emission standpoint, we're really tackling that big greenhouse gas emitter, which is your furnace and your water heater. Um, but we've been allowing people to retain the stove um, within their home, which is the biggest source of indoor air quality concerns. So I'm um, really thinking about how we're gonna evolve the code to merge those two goals about addressing the indoor outdoor air quality issues with our greenhouse emissions goals um, is related to that. So just wanted to lay some background there. Heidi, um, next slide. Uh, Carolyn, before you go to the next slide, may mm -hmm. I ask a question if, if that's Absolutely. Right? Please, and I should have framed that. Please in interrupt me at any point in time. This is meant to be a dialogue. And and I and I should know this better. You know, I play enough in fringes of this problem to, but I often stumble over what net zero really means, what is being measured, what was actually accomplished. Like some folks might say, well, you know, you have an electric car. So if the electric car is energized through a grid that's all renewable, that's uh, you know zero energy, zero emissions, if you will. However, the life cycle, so the car is built. So before you begin plugging it in, the construction of that, the construction of the home, the imp implementation of solar panels, that involves use of energy. So where do we start measuring the net zero-ness of this? Yeah, Marty, that's a great, that's a really great framing question. So the way our code is currently structured is around the annualized usage piece of the operational energy only. Um, and so it's the um, modeled 
consumption um, for that building as it's being, you know, for its construction, what it should use in terms of what its modeled envelope is and its appliance usage compared to how much it self generates. Um, that's, that's how we define net zero in our building codes. Um, within our roadmap though, um, we're really recognizing the, the life cycle, more of the life cycle impact. So really thinking about how we're going to, um, in the next code style, cycle start to introduce some of these broader concerns around what we call embodied carbon. Um, so thinking about the materials of construction, thinking about the technology choices. We haven't introduced that into the current code, um, but it is um, work. And you're starting to see those types of codes emerging in places like Vancouver, Seattle, where they're really talking more about the life cycle carbon of the building, which includes both the, the materials of construction as well as the operational energy. Very helpful, thank you. Yeah. Carolyn, I, I had a question. Oh, yes, absolutely, Susan. It, it's, pro it's probably a stupid question, but I, I, I think I heard you say the limitations on the amount of solar that we can put on a house limit kind of how much electrification we can do. Is that the 120% limit? That is correct. So when we refer to the 120% limit, what the nuance that comes into play is that so you can only oversize your under current regulation. And I know we have some conversations in the community about changing that and we'll backstop our code just to rest assured on that one. Um, but um, the current limitation is that you can over only oversize your system by about 20%. That's enough to cover your gas fireplace, your um, gas cooktop, but it's not enough to cover your water heater and your furnace. And so that's really the, the piece that has driven um, the kind of transition that we've seen in our community. So the much higher heat pump adoption electrification. And, and I will say of the homes that have gone in um, with all electric heating, um, it's about 50% of those have still put in line, put in place the gas line um, for the purposes of the stove. You know, the, the thing we value is the elite um, thermidor cooktop and the um, gas fireplace. Um, so people are still choosing to put those in. Um, so it's certainly addressed, like I said, our uh, major greenhouse gas emissions impact, but not necessarily some of the things we're talking about in terms of air quality. All right, so pardon, pardon my ignorance, but I thought the 120% was related to your previous year's use. You know, when I put solar on my house, it was related to how much electricity I used in the previous year. So how does that work in new construction? So it's what the modeled usage is gonna be. So you submit a load calculation to the utility based. Um, so the same thing you have to do under our code to, to show what your um, energy usage is gonna be, you submit to the utility. Um, so if you do not have a prior year or you're materially changing. Um, so, um, you know, we have this with many folks who are electrifying their existing homes, they can get a um, modeled estimate of what their usage would be and the utility will accept that as representative of their annualized usage. Okay, so I guess what I don't understand is if you included an electric furnace and an electric hot water heater in your modeling, mm -hmm. then that would be your 100%. So how does the 120% limit you? Um, so um, the 120% is based on your modeled electricity. So let's take the counter to what you asked. So if you were planning to put in a gas furnace and a gas water heater, which is the typical baseline of what people construct today um, outside of Boulder, you know, so just if you think about our, our um, national building codes and where they drive you today, it's a high efficiency gas furnace and water heater. Mm -hmm. um, when the utility determines how much solar you can put on, it's on the balance of your electrical loads. Um, and from a net zero perspective, we're converting your gas usage to a total energy consumption. And so you can't put a big enough solar system to offset that gas usage specifically. If so your modeling basically gas, doesn't, the, the modeling basically doesn't allow you to model an electric furnace and hot and no, no. So yeah, so if you're putting an electric furnace and an and a electric water heater and you model that, you can size your solar system exactly right to meet that. And that one, and the 120% gives you enough cushion to ha still have some gas appliances in your home. So it's really because those um, appliances, your furnace and your water heater consume so much energy, if they aren't electric, you just can't put enough solar on based on the regulation. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Yeah. So Heidi, next slide. So I'm gonna just talk briefly about what we're doing on the commercial side. Um, so largely our commercial code has been very prescriptive in nature. And what we did this year is, um, this past year was transition to a similar structure as the um, residential code, which is a performance-based code. And so as we ratchet that performance requirement down, you're gonna see the same thing happening on the commercial side that we just discussed on the residential side where um, your performance requirement is so stringent, um, it favors an all electric construction um, and moves away from gas. Um, and so that's, that was our first step towards a similar model for commercial construction as we see on residential. Um, the other thing I'll comment is um, we've now introduced the requirement, a minimum requirement of uh, solar installed um, with the idea being that, you know, if you have to put 5% of um, solar on to cover at least 5% of your load, you're going to take the incremental step to add more panels. Um, and then we have already electric and electric ready requirements on the transportation side. So requirements in our commercial code about building out infrastructure for charging. Um, and our intent is through the next code cycle to provide similar requirements, both in residential and commercial um, for heating and cooling. Um, and so even if it's not an all electric construction, ensuring the infrastructure is there for the conversion at a later date. Hey, Carolyn, a quick question. How, what are the incentives that, that you're considering in convincing um, a property owner to go all electric in their building, as opposed to gas, which is running very cheap at this time, uh, but of course defeats the purpose of the environmental concerns. Yeah, so the first step with this code is um, there are certain types of buildings and certain types of construction projects where we don't have a, um, a <coughs> which is energy use per, per square foot target um, in which they have to go through the prescriptive path, meaning um, they have to meet a certain performance requirement for like the envelope or other components. And what we did is if you have an all electric construction um, under this current code, um, your requirements that you have to hit are less stringent. So you only have to be a lower percentage above code minimum um, if it's all electric and a much higher one if it's if gas. So that's the first incentive is that if you choose all electric, you have more flexibility um, and can go slightly less um, efficient. It's still, I mean, I don't want to represent that as you know, energy hogs, right? They're still above code minimum, but it's um, it's easier. And there's also some other components around there around, you know, we envision uh, uh, considerations being made for buildings that are, are going to strive for net zero um, ahead of schedule um, for certain allowances. Um, so I think, you know, council talked last night about, um, oh, I'm blanking on the, the term, but, um, you know, what are the trade-offs um, that builders are willing to do for certain uh, alleviations of codes? We talk about it a lot in the height limitations, but there's other requirements where we may allow different um, choices to be made um, as an alternative to meeting our code if they're taking a tactic that aligns with our roadmap. Thanks. Early, early impressions, are the incentives working? Um, so it's interesting. Um, COVID has kind of messed with our ability to really track how much traction we're getting that. Mm -hmm. I think what we're seeing on the commercial side is a lot of multifamilies, about 50% of our multifamilies are going in all electric. And that's not because the code is easier, but rather, well, it's, it's not because of the incentives we put into the code, but rather the cost effectiveness of building all electric within the constraints of our code um, is better um, for multifamily buildings at this point. You know, so we're stringent enough on multifamily and when you think about having to provide in-unit heating and cooling, we're seeing a lot of um, builders and developers choose an all-electric construction and forego that gas infrastructure. So they're saving um, that cost of the gas build out um, in favor of kind of the diversity they get and the, the better um, in-unit um, service delivery they get from an all-electric selection. Great. Next slide, Heidi. This is just our roadmap. You'll see it and we talked to it. So we do have this plan to um, prepare updated codes every few years. Um, so our next cycle, um, we're a little, this is when we start working on it. The code gets introduced slightly after, but with the idea that by 2031, the building should 
produce as much energy as it's consuming. Um, so that's the roadmap. Um, and again, what we're seeing is once you get below a certain threshold and we haven't modeled it yet, but we know it's there, um, it's going to drive an all electric selection. Mm -hmm. At least for heating and cooling. And in commercial buildings, there's little reason to put gas in if it's not for heating and cooling, unless it's a, a, um, re, uh, something like a restaurant um, type application, right? Is the PV means photovoltaic on the slide? Correct. Yes. Thank um, you. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. So does the PV source have to be related to the building in proximity or can they be buying um, molecules from afar? So under our code, first you must maximize the use of your available space as your first means. Um, so on site um, rooftop system. If you are limited, um, so let's say you just don't have enough roof area or you're in a shaded area or an orientation that's not favorable or, you know, we know with some of our taller buildings um, we're limited. Your next choice is to procure um, from offsite, whether it's a solar garden, renewable connect, and we, we allow that. If you can't achieve that, so meaning there's not a subscription available um, or capacity within that, you can pay into the fund which we then reinvest largely in low income programs. Um, so to some of the earlier conversations, we have this energy impact offset fund where in lieu of code compliance, both in our smart regs and our building codes, as well as our marijuana um, industry, they can pay in and then we do use that for low, low income solar garden subscriptions, efficiency for low income housing. Um, so trying to achieve a similar impact, um, but through a different uh, segment of our community. Mm. To, to get that larger offset by 2031, is that going to be occurring through these alternate means? Because after all, the building footprints are not going to change dramatically in terms of their construct and how many panels can supply a offsetting of the usage. So in principle, and we've modeled it for a typical commercial, so let's say a commercial office space building and, and looking at some of the ones we have out at um, Boulder Junction, which are net zero at this point, huh. um, where the technology is going on efficiency, you should be able to do it on site. Um, I think if you get up to four stories um, or really high density, that's that's where we might see some procurement off site or if you're an industrial building. Well, I'm impressed. I did not know that, like, I mean, I have a house you know, not quite 2,000 square feet. I've got um, a, a 4.6 kilowatt um, system. I've had it on the roof for 15 years. It's probably only 75% as effective as it used to be. I'm all electric, um, but I don't offset all of my usage. I'm not a hog. I don't have the thermostat high. I don't have AC. I have a swamp cooler and I, you know, most of my roof space is used. I, I couldn't meet that goal. So I'm surprised that these new buildings with um, the systems that exist can do it. I'm, I'm really very happy to hear that. Yeah, so it's all about envelope and, um, uh, you know, so, so thinking about where we lose a lot is, is truly in the envelope. And so as we tighten up that envelope and we make better choices in our appliances and efficiency, um, we can maximize roof space. Now, I, I don't wanna portray that every home in Boulder um, is going to work because more um, because of shading and orientation. Like we know, as we get into some smaller lots, if we think about future redevelopment, there's more lots that are oriented in ways that this isn't going to work quite as well for. And we'll see some offsite purchase, but with the grid emissions also declining, if we're driving towards electric, we're similarly accomplishing the same thing. Thank you. But yeah, like the the Boulder Commons um, buildings, those are, are net zero um, by design, and we're seeing more and more of that being constructed as proactive by the builders. Cool. Great. Next slide, Heidi. Um, but which brings us to the challenge, right? So I, I alluded to the fact that um, there's not a lot of new development um, space. We, I mean, we see some redevelopment and other opportunities, but to hit our goals in terms of both um, emissions and air quality concerns, we have to tackle our existing building stock and there's a lot of challenges to that. So just a few highlights, um, Heidi, next slide. Um, and if you can work through the um, animation on this one, Heidi, I think there's a, yeah, a few. Um, thank you, there, that's perfect. So 
Nope, back, my friend and colleague, Brett Kincaren, did an analysis um, based on some of his experience. And so I attribute these numbers to him, but I think it's really representative. And this, this took a, a typical um, home in Boulder um, that's gone through a electrification, so a retrofit, um, you know, making sure that we're tightening the envelope of the home through um, better air insulation and air sealing. Um, with our contractor markets today, it doesn't matter if you're putting in a conventional air, air conditioner and furnace or a heat pump, it's very expensive. Um, so, you know, having to replace your um, heating appliance, it can be on the order of $20,000 um, or more depending on the complexity of your home. Um, if you want to get um, the economics to really work so it favors you, you're saving money with your um, electrification choice, putting your solar on. You know, the ideal is, um, solution is the self-contained home of about $38,000. Um, and as we know, even for our affluent members of our community, that's a big price tag um, to undertake and make a choice. Do you put your kid through college for a year or do you electrify your home? Um, and if we think about the 18,000 single family homes in, in Boulder, you know, that's a price tag of $684 million, right? So it's not like the government's going to be able to pay for that either. And so really tackling that is our number one um, priority. And, and how do we remove that upfront barrier to capital um, for, for people who, um, regardless of where they are in their choice, so they're at the end of equipment life on their existing equipment or they're um, a climate leader and wanna make that change now. How do we get rid of that upfront um, barrier in terms of the 38,000 or more dollars that they have to invest? Um, because that's, that's a challenge, like I said, for even our affluent members. Now think about equity um, and people who don't necessarily even have that capital to begin with. They don't have the credit to take out a loan or their renters um, or other community members. And so what we've been very focused on um, last year and will continue this year is this idea of removing um, the financing um, of these types of projects from the individual and applying it to the home. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I think many folks have been around and heard of um, earlier programs called PACE finding, financing, which is property assessed clean energy, where they, where you could get the loan, but it um, was um, allocated through property taxes um, to the premise or the, the home itself. So if you sold the home, the idea was that, that the people who were continuing to get the benefit of your investment would continue paying for it. Um, there's a different um, form of financing that's been emerging that actually ties it to your utility meter. And so tariff-based on-bill financing is a term that you may hear. Um, and the idea is that either through the utility or a private investor, um, the cost of that conversion would be covered and then the repayment of that financing would occur through your utility bills. And there's models where you know your repayment is less than um, what you're actually saving. And um, so your net benefit is there. And so um, the, we, in partnership with some of our neighboring communities, um, did a study last year. There's been some initial conversation around um, regulatory or legislative pathways to introduce this. But this is, I think, really the game changer that we as a community need is to, is to get this alternative financing mechanism in place. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, if we think about um, most homes aren't designed for all electric right now. So there's a utility component to this of upgrading um, that infrastructure, same kind of model. And we've seen early progress from our utilities on the vehicle electrification side. So um, some recent adoption there. So we think we have traction in the coming years to introduce this. So this is, you know, in my bucket list, this is, this is the thing I most hope to accomplish as a city of Boulder employee before I um, hit my retirement, but hopefully sooner, because uh, I think it's really a really important thing for us. Carolyn, can I throw out a example of a cross-cutting concern for an EAB? Mm -hmm. So um, here we've got this great um, um, panels on rooftops, great system, um, and we're putting them on all the roofs. All right, super. Climate change. Uh, the climate is becoming more volatile. Um, there are studies that speak to increasing um, summertime thunderstorm intensity that produces larger hailstorms. So uh, we haven't had one in Boulder lately. It's been a while. Uh, we have had some in outlying communities, Colorado Springs and so forth in Denver. If a major hailstorm were to sweep through Boulder with an installed PV on rooftops, 
what might be the damage and what might it do to our energy infrastructure if it was wiped out by a hailstorm? Yeah, so I will liken you to um, the hailstorm that came through and I wanna say it was um, two or three years ago. Um, so it lightly, lightly hit Boulder, but it more significantly hit our neighboring communities. Um, yeah. Um, Louisville, Longmont, um, did uh, Louisville, Lafayette did some significant damage in that area. Um, an interesting thing is is the PV largely um, went unscathed. Um, there were some damage to one or two panels, but not total loss of system, which is, you know, I think speaks to the resilience of of um, the work that the developers have had to do um, in, in firming up those systems and, and really submitting them to those climate impacts. I think the, the more notable thing we saw um, that I would liken to is, is less like that physical damage. Um, our fires um, that hit this past fall um, took a significant impact on our, on our solar production as a community. Um, you know, we, it, that kind of particulate matter um, really impacts our um, solar insulation. And so what's normally a good production time for our community um, was definitely significantly down. So if wow. we think about fires, we are certainly expecting to see loss of production. I think that's where diversity um, in how we deploy these is important storage, um, as well as just thinking about the interplay with the, the grid as a just, um, a mechanism for dispatching distributed assets from other parts of the state. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, for example, Excel filed their clean energy announcement earlier this week, um, noting that a significant portion of that will be made up with distributed assets. And I think that is the concept is that um, we don't want to just rely on one single large centralized and we don't necessarily want to rely just solely on single distributed assets because we are going to see these types of climate impacts. Yeah, interesting. Um, About the fire, do you, do you have a rough number, what you estimate the uh, shielding effect to have been? Um, we haven't gotten to see all the data yet. It was uh, one of the things we became aware of it is the city just installed a bunch of systems and we were getting ready to in energize and we had to have like seven consecutive days of um, good solar insulation to, to basically qualify the system. Mm. And we had to take months. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I watched my system. I could I could see the shielding effect taking you know, kilowatt hours out of my purse, if you will, and off the grid. So yeah, I know you're right. I'd be curious to know what the integrated effect was on the community. That's a very good point. Mm -hmm. And yeah. for Hail Marty, I think they're designed to withstand at least golf ball size. You know, I Is think that if right? You get, if you get bigger oh. than that, maybe you might see some damage. Like Carolyn says, usually it's not the whole system. It's like a panel or two. Okay. Um, but yeah, I remember I installed a system on my house like right after that major storm and the installer was showing me pictures of, uh, you know, a couple, some of their installs that had been damaged that they were repairing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, surprisingly, like there's a few, but like if you looked at it compared to the cars with their windows blown out and... Yeah, exactly. Or like that every house need, in Jeffco needed a new roof in some neighborhoods. Um, the, right. You know, they're made out of glass, but they're actually surprisingly strong and they're designed to withstand a lot of abuse. Yeah, they are. Um, and I would also point out that um, there's systems who um, survived hurricanes as well. Um, so if you think about Florida, Georgia, there's some very large systems deployed in that region. And they were not the thing that went on offline during some of those major hurricanes. Bigger problem for them was probably being underwater rather than the yeah, wind. Yeah, exactly. Mm. All right. Well, we've got nine minutes left in our schedule, so I, this is great, Carolyn. But yeah. it sounds uh, like seems like we should try to hurry along. Yep, absolutely. And I think um, Heidi, next slide. Um, yeah. So just some other priorities. I just talked about workforce development, making sure we have the supply chain in place. And then Heidi, I think the next one is just. Um, uh, centering equity. Um, so just to this point, um, we do know that a lot of our community members currently don't have access to cooling or adequate heating. We've talked a little bit a while ago about the need for, you know, the opportunity for good indoor air quality ventilation associated with heat pumps, um, but being very cognizant that many of these folks are already experiencing a significant energy burden. So whatever we do needs to take that into account and center that fact that um, you know, 10% of Colorado residents currently um, are overly burdened by their energy costs. And I think that was my last slide. 
it was. Great, thank you. Does anyone have follow questions for Carolyn though? Let's try to keep it brief. Good. All right. Um, yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk about this. I know, you know, there is some ask from council to get back to them. I don't know, they'll have time today to really dig into that. So that might be something you guys need to take up in the next meeting or meeting after that as a board. Love that financing idea, Carolyn. And can we get a copy of this presentation? Yeah, I sent it to Heidi so she can send it out as a PDF to everyone. Awesome, thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, I'd love to hear what you guys are doing on the workforce development side, but I think there's a, maybe, that, maybe that's another conversation. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, agree on the financing piece. It's exciting and necessary. Um, okay, well, it seems like there is, you know, we only have seven minutes left in our schedule and I'd like to, in my last meeting as chair, keep us on, at least adjourn on time. Um, so I don't know if we want to try to quickly deal with the air quality piece or put it off until next month. If folks have, I, I, don't, I guess I, I don't know Brett and Miriam how, um, how long you think that'll take? It seems like a pretty big topic. So the uh, the idea is to continue the conversation with the county and, and keep bringing our ideas forward to them and work as a partner with them uh, on bringing results to the city. Um, I'm, I didn't have any idea that the MENV students were um, working on stuff for the city and it's really exciting to, to see that there's, you know, student thought going into some, hopefully some interesting solutions um, for, for the city. Um, but I, I don't know what, about timing, Brett, and I actually don't even know what the timing is for, for Colin's group to keep moving forward as well. The goal in my eyes is to have some sort of action before the wildfire season starts. And so if we need to wait till next month to address it, that's fine, but we're cutting it close. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be great if, I think it's been great that you and staff and EAB have been pushing this and it seems like it's actually moving forward and yeah to the extent it'd be great to build on that momentum and not let it drop so I mean go ahead no go ahead Mary. I was just going to say I could quickly go through the talking points that I sent to Brett and Carolyn um that we were going to bring forward to the county um in whatever next meeting we had and i definitely would like your guys' input or and or approval of those talking points. Um, so I could go through that quickly before we adjourn in the next five minutes. What I was going to suggest, Miriam, is are, is there anything in the talking points that you think is especially time sensitive that we should at least raise tonight? And then I think, Carolyn, I think maybe it would be good if you and Miriam and I could set up a call to, to work through kind of some next steps. And then I think, and also perhaps talk about what roles or actions we might want EAB to, to engage with beyond this. So, but is there anything Miriam that you see that we, you wanna especially highlight from those talking points? So what I felt, found super interesting about the presentations that was that were pre given during, in the regional meeting was that many of the cities are using these air sensors to supplement whatever data they're collecting with the more robust monitoring systems. And I believe that having a network of the sensors in Boulder will help us have a more clear picture of impacts to the community on 
a, a relatively inexpensive basis. Um, and, and it seems like the city could have a role in trying to get people interested in buying those. I don't know. There's a lot of dorks here in Boulder. Absolutely. That I think if, <laughs> yeah, yeah. if they knew that it would be helpful to the city and, you know, that they could see, you know, we're seeing their data being at least displayed on their site would be interested in shelling out the, I don't remember, or, it's a couple hundred or bucks, like, right? You know, another thought I has was, you know, just put them at every school, you know, and get the kids involved with, you know, looking at the data and learning from this, you know. I mean, <laughs> yeah, so I think there's a bunch of really good stuff here. I think part of the other thing I want to really dig into with this board is it's one thing to have the data and it's another thing for the most vulnerable populations to have some way of accessing it that they're going to use. Um, right. So I think we need, and it might mean that we need to do some user testing or user engagement around how would this information, once it's being gathered, somehow is it alerts that go to people's phones and that people in those neighborhoods then can get sign up so they don't have to go to a website to look, you know what I'm saying? Right, so, but I mean, and you guys have initiated a conversation with Denver people, the Love My Air people, and, and I think we can learn from them and and gain I mean, potentially resources from them as well. I think that's to be seen. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, so let's do this. I We have time next month. Um, next month, I should just note for everybody, we will, and I'll just say this very quickly. We, we um, and maybe I said this through email, we, we will be coming back to you with a draft of the memo and the, the climate action framework next month. You'll be the first and only board to see that ahead of a council session. Um, it is not intended to be the final plan. I just want to make sure that we, I emphasize that point, um, uh, even when we take it to council. So, but I think we should be able to schedule some time in next month's meeting to continue this topic. And so maybe Carolyn, you and Miriam and I can tee up kind of how to really bring this forward in an efficient way. Sure. I think one of my messages I think to the board is, um, you know, we typically think of this as a county role. And so I think helping to, um, advise council and, and us on where the city's nexus is within that, I think is, is really the, the critical um, opportunity. And I think there's a lot of things we can do. I, I think making sure that we're hearing from you as to how we differentiate those roles, I, I think will be really important. Yeah, and I, I don't know that it's, well, I think that this board has been saying this, I just encourage you to keep saying it, that really emphasizing how is it that we're gonna figure out who is most vulnerable and how are we gonna make sure that we reach them with both the information and the support they need in this next sequence of fire and smoke occurs. And I, that's the thing that keeps me up at night is are we doing the things that are gonna be necessary to really be enabling most of those folks to be ready for this? Cause it is gonna happen and we know it. Um, and, and, and this is back to Jonathan's I guess, focus on resilience and vulnerability. So we can all be equally vulnerable, let's say, to a fire sweeping across the city, but only a small fra only a certain fraction are resilient to bouncing back from that. Right. So the vulnerability may be equal, but the resilience is the one where the inequities begin to show because the resources aren't there to recover. Yeah. So the community loses its, its, its capacity to stay a community if there's a large hole, a large gap in the resilience part, I think more so than in the vulnerability part. I, I agree with you, Marty, but I do think we have to differentiate between our threats here. Air quality does not necessarily destroy structures when it moves through, but it does it does erode health. Yeah. And that what we know is, that especially in, in frontline communities, it's that gradual long-term erosion of health that's really the most damaged that that's, that's the really damaging part of that factor. I agree. Now I'm, we're talking different hazards. Yes. I agree. Yep. Very good. Well, I want to honor our chair for taking us to the end and to the time. And Justin, thanks again. Yes, thank you, Justin. Well, Missy, doesn't he get a farewell address like George Washington? <laughs> I mean, do you want to warn us against uh, entangled alliances with other boards or something like that? <laughs> I'm going to stay out of that one. Um, no, I just say keep up the good work. I think in my, it's been great to see 
I think the board become a more meaningful body and have more of an impact in even in the three years I've been on it. So I just encourage you guys to keep moving in that direction. I think it's, uh, it seems like there's a lot going on and going to be exciting few years. Yeah. Justin, also, I just wanted to let you know to check your email um, because there should be a gift card in your email oh. inbox. Wow, I didn't expect this. I have to report it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank well, you. Thank you, City yeah, of Boulder. Fully, in, fully installed solar system replacing the old one. <laughs> yeah, it's $18,000 worth of energy <laughs> upgrades for my home. <laughs> Uh, and then we have a new board, a new member coming next month. Is that right? Yeah, we don't know who it is yet. So okay. as soon as we know, we'll let you know. But yeah, I'm sorry we don't get to do this in person, but um, hopefully I'll continue to run into everyone around town. <laughs> Definitely see you. All right. Bye, everyone. Okay. Bye. 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 Have a great Bye, night. Guys.